let me begin by saying that if you are an advocate for old-fashioned D&D, if you believe that D&D should be simple, if you believe that there's no need to do more to prepare for your D&D games than create uh, dungeons and adventures, if you are not a sandbox player and <laughs> you are an advocate of paper, pencil and paper D&D, you should stop watching this video right now because I'm going to go through some stuff which is more about game design than it is about D&D and it is definitely not something that can be done with pencil and paper. I'm going to go I think right down the rabbit hole here I had thought of a number of ways in which to describe what I have been calling online my trade tables for some time now. I've, I've thought about the best way to describe this and I thought I could give an overview or I could do I could be very precise with it. I could I could just go through every step. I think I'm going to go somewhere in the middle. Uh, I am going to try and give as much information as I can. I don't know if I'm going to get all through this in an hour, but we will do the best. We will do the best that we can. Um, what we're looking at here is a map of France and Germany. Uh, the computer is complaining. The uh, This portion up here, this is Germany. This is northern Italy down here. This is France in this general area. These are the low countries. You can recognize Holland in this. Here is the most recent part of my world that I have mapped. Uh, I've been working on other parts because I've been remapping because I lost a program. I lost a previous version of Publisher. I had to buy a new one and now it doesn't support some of the things that my old maps were made on and I've been working on old maps and re revamping them. But this is the most recent map that I have made from scratch. This is France and you will notice that there are these straight lines all over with arrows. These are meant simply to indicate where I wish roads to go. Part of the reason for making these maps, the principal reason for making these maps, apart from playing the game, has been to design my trade table off of them. I've had other people offer other ways for me to make maps, and for the most part, they wouldn't be very much use to me because I can't manipulate them the way that I can maps that I have made myself. So here we're looking at Riem and Chalon in these are areas in Champagne, Champagne, uh, Champagne in northern France. The, uh, the first thing that I would need to do with each of these is determine the distance between the various trade cities. Now, these symbols here, these are trade towns. There's uh, Leon and Riem and Soissons and Troyes and so on and so forth. And my French pronunciation is probably hideous and some of you out there are <laughs> bristling. But nevertheless, the, uh, the actual trade, uh, some of you will remember, the actual trade is from this table here. Now, at the moment, this table does not include France. Uh, I have the France on another table, but where it says market here, these notations here are markets. Uh, five ref or four references, five references, one reference to these various locations. So that is what determines what is a market and what is not a market. All of the markets in a given region are all considered part of a zone. For example, in this particular region of Champagne, we have Riem and we have Chalon and we have Troy, and these are all part of the same market zone. So that in a market zone like Belgaum in India, we have two trade towns. Not all zones have more than one trade town, but the issue became how to divide up provinces, the reference I have for, for provinces between various trade towns. For example, most of the references I have 
for what's produced in this area come from the actual Champagne. So how much of that comes from Riem, how much of that comes from Chalon, I don't know. So I consider these all part of the same zone and that solves me that problem. Now, to determine the distance between Riem and Chalon, what I don't do is measure it specifically. Um, I could, but it doesn't need to be that precise, not in my opinion. So what I prefer to do is, is work it out according to the work it out according to the the actual elevation between the two places. So I take the elevation for the hex that Riem is in. I can delete that. And that is 324 feet above sea level, so I can put 324. And I take the amount that is in Chalon, that is 246. And I change this to a negative one so that it adds one to the total. Now the distance is usually measured in one hex. In this case, the difference in elevation adds point two to that distance, so that I determine for my purposes the distance between Riem and Chalon is 1.2. Now, the reason for that number and how that number works will come clear later. In the meantime, we will simply draw a road and we will send it to the back. So it's all nice and neat. And thus we have the road between those two things. Now, obviously, I could draw that road any way I wanted. We could make it a lot straighter. It doesn't really matter. The uh, the main purpose of it is that uh, we see that the road is there and that that is a major trade road. Now, if we were determining the distance between Chalon and Metz, well, there are a number of different ways that that road could go, right? It could go this way, conceivably. Or obviously, it could go the other way. Now, the way we determine which direction that road actually goes is we calculate both distances. So we start with Chalon here, that's 246. And the next one here, this hex here, is 285. And then moving the one up, we do 485 and 587 with Verdun in it, and 602 and 669 because that hex is there and then Metz moving that is 492 right now we change any positives to negatives so that they add we change any negatives to positives so that they add and uh, there's a bridge across Verdun here now there's various reasons for doing this I could have done it a different way anybody could do it however please them but uh, I decided that the more important element here was that the bridge sped up the the travel time and so where the bridge crosses at Verdun is less um, actually means that there's no punishment for that so I know other people would add taxes and so on and so forth but I've decided not to do that it seemed quibbling to me and uh, uh, there are taxes inherent in the system. There's there's time elements and other things inherent in the system. So I don't really need to get into that. Anyway, um, the means that I prefer to do it. So we see that by the first means, we have a distance of 7.5 if we go that direction. Now we can do that again. If I take that and I pull it over to here, we get rid of There's no tolls. And we go in the other direction. And we, again, 246, 285, but now we're going to do 328. Then we're going to do 702, which is probably going to ruin it. And then 602, 669. And in fact, it is the shorter way. I am surprised. So that means that our road would therefore come down here follow the river some, probably deviate from that town, come through the bar, pass over there, and stay within the borders and come right up to Metz.
and then I would make a notation. I didn't for the other one. Oh, and it's complaining at me. Let's copy that over and let's put that at 1.2 and let's put this one here at 7.3. so that we have a distance. Now I would do this for all of these various all of these various areas. And I have done this for vast, vast areas of my world. I've calculated every road exactly in this way. And I have recorded all of those calculations in a table which I put up on my blog some time ago. I put all those calculations on a table that, oh, I see it's uh, over here, that looks like this. Now it gets so big that I couldn't keep it, keep track of it on just one page. So there's actually three pages of this. This is the west page. Uh, this shows all the various connections between places in Germany. Some of them, like here, are the uh, uh, the crossroads and so on is referenced to make it easy for me to identify where the roads are and so on and compare them to the map. But in in the main, the direct passage and route to each of these places looks like this. If I come over here and I, well, let's do it this way. Uh, I think it's called Central. Here is the uh, here is the main center of the uh, areas that I have done. So, uh, with with just a general map, uh, just the general coastlines all sorted out. Now, there's a different way of doing the coastlines. For every hex, I count one third of a distance. So. Uh, Travel by sea is, of course, much more much more uh, uh, profitable than it is by land. But the main thing is to take all of these individual places and compare the distance traveled from every other place, so that we can get a sense. Uh, don't you love Italy? So we can get a sense of how far each place is from every other place. The main difficulty, of course, is that this would mean that if we wanted to get from, say, Posani to, um, say, Varna over here, what is the shortest route? I mean, you're looking at all of these different possible routes, and of course there's always the possible route of coming down to the sea and then coming around the south of, of, of Greece. So, so what is the shortest route between Posani and Varna? Now, I have to tell you, this was a huge problem for me for a very long time. But I discovered a trick. Now, I created this file and I will come up closer to it. This is, uh, say, let's look at Chittagong or if we prefer, let's look at Pozani. And of course it doesn't like me. spelling it backwards. I want Posani from. Well, you're going to have to excuse me. All right, so Posani can be approached from three, four different places. From Vienna, from Gottwaldov, from Yanakel, and from Sopron. So if we look at this original map here, you can see that all four of those areas there's Posani here, are attached. There's, there's Vienna, there's Sopron, there's Yannickel, and there's Gottwaldorf. So let me, let me go back to this. So, these all work out from what is the shortest, the shortest route. So that this says that uh, it's 0.3 from B730 and B730 if we come up here uh, could do the shorter I suppose but uh, B730 is Vienna 
So it is 0.3 from Vienna and it automatically adds 0.3 and then this number takes the lowest from all of these. Now normally this would be a problem because if Vienna is taking from the next place and the next place you wind up, if you know XL, you have ridiculous amounts of circular arguments and it doesn't work. But there is a trick. And I discovered this and it's absolutely marvelous. If you go to XL options, to formulas, you can pick the number of iterations that it goes so it won't calculate more than one time. This means that you won't get circular you won't get circular totals. And that is very important for this sort of thing. Because if you have Vienna working out the distance, the nearest distance that it is, if you have Vienna working out the nearest distance that it is from Posani at the same time that Posani is working out the nearest distance that it is from Vienna, then you will they'll conflict with each other and you won't get any totals. But if you reduce it to one iteration, then it, you won't get any circular arguments. So let us suppose, I'm fumbling around a bit because there's quite a lot of things here. Let us suppose we want the distance of Vienna from every other place. And we wanted to do this as, well, as reasonably automatic as possible. We would take, to begin with, this long, long file, and I'll just show you, these are all the various, each orange, each orange city is a trading city. So these are all the various trade cities, market cities that I have in my world, and all their distances from every other adjacent place, both by sea and by land, so that they can each be calculated out. And as you can see, this is an extensive list. So if I want to know the distance of Vienna from everywhere else, I merely have to create, I have to overwrite this minimum number here and put in a zero. Now that will begin to calculate every other total here all the way through the system every time that I calculate or hit F9. So it will go in and out and the numbers will shrink and settle themselves out and steadily you will get to know see it's steadily as I press the button it will eventually establish until I have the shortest distance Vienna can reach from every single place. Now you can look at the one on the the right column. There's no designation. There's no zero designation. So therefore it's still going up. It will go up forever until one of those numbers is put zero. But I, I have two columns here so that when I want I have two columns here so that when I want to re-establish Vienna or rather the the total that I have for Vienna, then I can simply fill left or fill right and make that go back to the beginning so that if I want a different city, I can pick a different city. So that's just to keep the calculations. Now what I would do is I would go through this and after I had determined all the things with Vienna and I would separate the uh, highlighted figures from the non-highlighted figures, and there's a number of ways to do that. Um, if you know Excel, I, I'm not going to get into Excel, but there are, there are ways to do that, to sort it out. And what you wind up with are a series of columns which I have included in a file which is my All Zones file. Now here are the market provinces. The totals here are these are the trading cities that were in orange before. This is all of them, except for France, which I have not added to this yet. These are the various zones that the trading cities get the material from. These are the distances, therefore, from the trade that the trading city is from the various zone. So that, uh, and you can see that there are quite a lot of zones. So that I know that the total of Chittagong from 
in this case Brindisi and Napoli, Naples, is, is uh, 129.6 hexes with the differences of the elevation and the fact that over C's three hexes equals one hex because each C hex is only worth a third of a hex in terms of the distance here. So this gives us this gives us a fairly precise number for the distances between every single place. And you can work out these totals um, on mass. You can do a whole bunch of them at the same time by simply duplicating the column in the previous table that I was doing as far as you can extend. I can't do them all at the same time because well, I don't have enough memory on my computer to do them all at the same time, but you can do them piece by piece until you ultimately have a file that looks like this. And this is this looks massive, but of course this was all gener generated automatically, so it's just a matter of copying the material step by step until you have it all together in one place. It's something I don't like to do very often. When I finish France, everywhere will have a distance from France. And ultimately, I will need to add France to this table, and that will be annoying. Because all of these places, of course, will also need a distance from France. And France will provide shortcuts between places that are, it doesn't really matter, but you get the idea. So let's suppose that I now want to have the... Uh, the trade table for Posad, which we were talking about. Well, here's the here's the city of Posadi right here in Yatria in central Hungary. Here is the distance it is from all the various places. So all I need to do is highlight all of that and copy it. Now I move to the next table on this same file, to the next sheet, and there's a yellow highlighted here, and I will paste it as a value, which I've put as a button. This doesn't change the pasting as a value doesn't change the formatting, and it doesn't it doesn't overwrite any of the calculations for anything else. So I'm going to press that, and then that's going to put it here. Now what this does is we have all the various products that we have previously listed from the source table. Here are the various products here with the numbers of where they are produced and so on. This is distilled down into this other table over here where we have all the various source products and which zone that they are in. Now this again looks like this must have taken hours for me to copy but of course it was all cut and paste so that it was all placed in the right place. So here we have the total references for each of these provinces. Here's the total reference for Nordland in northern Norway. Here's the total references for Belgaum in central India and so on. So that we now, I couldn't say this with the last video, but now we can see that we have 16,666 references. That's just chance that it came out to that number, but And we, and we can see that 3,155 of those references are actually for markets. Because as you noticed before, not all markets have just one reference. Sometimes I would find again and again and again a particular city or some such which was referred to as a commercial center or a market center or a junction for trade or things along those lines. So every time that I came across that, I added another reference to it. So... 878 references for coal, uh, 230 references for salt, uh, 49 references for slate, 23 references for tourmaline, that sort of thing. So we take all of these numbers and we make a very, 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 very large spreadsheet. And I can come out, get so used to working in Publisher, and come out and you can see the general size of the spreadsheet. This computer won't even properly show the numbers. Now this spreadsheet takes enlarging it up, this spreadsheet takes this number that we have calculated from Posani, these group of numbers all in yellow here, and it adds one to them. 
Uh, I've pasted it here, but it adds one. And the reason it adds one is because the numbers under the column here are going to be divided by this number, and the minimum divided you're going to get is one. And that means that over here, where we're looking at Posani, and Posani is right there, this uh, Niatria, the reason, region where Posani is from, you'll see that it is a zero. If I divide all of these by zero, I'm going to get an error. So we add one to everything so that all the goods and trade that are centered on Posani are divided by one. So if it is positive and, and available in Posani, then it's going to be cheaper than it is from anywhere else. Everything from this area in uh, central Russia, which is a dwarven kingdom which I call Hoth, or this area from uh, the eastern Uzbekistan, which is Kokan, are going to be divided by 195. Um, Worms here is going to be divided by 17. Salzburg is going to be divided by 7. So all of the different areas are all going to be divided by different amounts. And that's going to be pulled together on this calculation page, in which it actually just simply has added 1 to this number here and has divided all of these automatically into all of their categories. So that when we divide the total production of, say, iron in southern Sweden, which is, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, I've lost, I've forgotten where Akershus is. Oh, pardon me, that's in Norway. Uh, Christianity is medieval Oslo. So the iron that is in Oslo here is divided by the distance from Oslo to Posani, and that gives us 0.12 references. All of those references then are added together into this number here. And this number here gives us the total number of references that are to be that are that apply to Posani and its trade with with uh, given the distance that Posani is from all the different areas that produce that produce iron. So that there's uh, 87 market references that uh, once you divide it into the distances from Posani and so on. And as, as you can tell, I can go and I can grab any one of these cities here. I can copy this out and within seconds I can have this number here that tells me what the total references is. So if I come back and I pick a completely different area, say um, uh, southern Italy, and I add that to the total as opposed to Posani. These aren't very far apart. Uh, I again can paste that way and now I can see from the calculation that the market change is almost exactly the same. Or perhaps I didn't I suspect it didn't actually grab the number. Huh? It didn't. It didn't put it into the it didn't put it into the, the the clipboard. So let's go and make sure we get that done right this time. Now normally I wouldn't have ever moved this. Alright, let's see if it puts it, okay, I put it into the clipboard that time. Uh, let me save it there. This is a very big file. Alright. And even so it still says 83. How very odd. But you'll notice that there's much less iron and there's much less coal. If I come back here and I pick this, this is uh, Gwadar, this is in southern Pakistan. So this is truly in a different part of the world. And we'll post that in there. And now you see the calculation. The markets are much reduced. They're down to 38. There's almost no iron or coal to be compared with anything else. So. I can work out that for every market. Oh, let me take a little bit of a drink. Okay, so what would I do now with this number? Well, I would grab it. Uh, oh, incidentally, while I'm here, just as a pause, as, as a pause, uh, the birth numbers here. This same system, of course, means that if you are in a particular part of the world 
and I choose to divide this number not by the, the amount of iron or the amount of coal or some such, but I choose to divide it by the population, and then it gives you the, the influence of that population upon that particular part of the world. So this 45,000 from Astrakhan is divided by 103, which is the distance from uh, Pakistan, where we last did our thing, and Astrakhan. And only 49 from Nellor or 17 from Surat, which is in western, western India. So obviously that if I calculate this out, then the likelihood is going to be far more that you are from if, if if you find a player character in Gwadar in southern Pakistan, chances are they're going to be from somewhere around Gwadar and not from Siberia, which is allows me to roll birthplaces perfectly randomly based on where the character first enters into the campaign. So not everybody is necessarily from the place that they are, but they can be expected to be from somewhere in the area. And then if you get some odd, very odd thing, so that somebody's from all the other side of the world, then uh, at least you know that it really was a low chance. It wasn't just, you're not just throwing numbers at a dart. And there just isn't, there just isn't any way to create a table with pencil and paper that will give you that kind of flexibility. You can only do that with spreadsheets and crunching numbers and this level of complexity. You simply can't do that if what you're doing is is uh, is just sketching out a two-dimensional table that has a list of, of places and a list of and, and you know a, a role on the side. You just can't get this kind of this kind of play. Now I'm kind of working on my birth tables because I'm trying to I'm trying to nail them down so that dwarves will only be from certain places and elves will only be from certain places and it's it's not a at the moment if i get an, an answer that doesn't really work uh, dwarves from india for example then i'm kind of ignoring it and rolling again but i would i would ultimately like to get the table worked out so that it determined every race in a rational and logical fashion so that if you are dwarven or you are half orc then the chances are you've got to be from some place where half orcs actually exist, um, as opposed to humans who exist everywhere. So anyway, skipping all of that, that being my my birthing table, which is perpetually in a state of half creation, it's just not. It just doesn't have that much priority for me. What we would do here is we would now grab this series of numbers, this collection here, and we would copy it. And we would come again to a completely different table. This is my prices table. Uh, this is the ultimate trade table. This is the one that actually determines what the price of anything is. So what I would do is I would paste those numbers. I would paste them uh, as a value again so that they don't change any of the calculations throughout this document. And there are lots and lots and lots of calculations throughout this document. So here we are in uh, we are in southern Pakistan. We have 1.3 references to zinc. We have 3.9 references to hides. We have 34 references to cereals. Well, it is Pakistan. Cereals being um, the grains themselves, not not obviously cereal has been invented in D&D. So we have all of these different things, which are all part of the system, including weapons. So we see that we have a number for weapons. So we can go to the references here. This is the references tab. Now, what? all, all of these are perpetually in a state of half creation, because uh, I'm always making slight changes, modifications. I'm always upgrading. I'm always changing something. And to upgrade this table is literally two, three months work. If I sit down and I want to do some serious upgrade, I have to put everything else on a shelf and do only this table. Um, and it, 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 it takes a tremendous amount of work. And mostly, this just determines the raw goods. It doesn't determine the, the, um, it doesn't determine the industrial products or anything like that. The reason for that is because the totals I have are based on a book for the uh, are based on a book from the United Nations called the Industrial Statistics Yearbook, 
And those numbers are much easier to compare with um, medieval times because we have more information about the production of raw goods going back to the 17th century. Now, I have to admit that I, I, I have made certain generalizations in order to figure out how much of a particular substance would be here. For example, I'm estimating, and for, to just keep everything at the same level, everything is listed in ounces, I'm estimating that my world is producing 20 20 billion ounces of iron per year. Now I can muck around with that, change it, move it up, move it down. Um, it's the one sort of ad hoc number, but it's an ad hoc number based on the same division as all the other numbers here from the same statistical source, which was as the earliest book that I could find, which was 1988. So it's not perfect, but it's better than pulling numbers out of your ass. It gives a, a much more, a, a bigger continuity to what the numbers would be. And I'm not making the decision for what's the most valuable and the least valuable object in what part of the world that it would be. If it's not me that decided that there are a lot of cereals in Pakistan, it was the, the reference book that I took it from, and it's not me that decided that this is how much iron there is. It's the it's the general ratio that I applied to industrialization numbers between 1650 and 1980 that I applied in order to get the the closest, shall we say, guesstimation of what those numbers ought to be. I, I think it works. I think the numbers are sound. I think it gives me good results, and I'm I'm fairly happy with the system. I would like, of course, exact, accurate numbers for how much iron was produced in 1650, but I don't have that information. No one does, and so I don't worry about the fact that I have to estimate it to a certain degree. I spent a lot of time researching it to find out what those estimations should be. And there has been a lot of material that's written comparing the development of industry, especially since the Industrial Revolution, but a lot of people have spent time comparing what the numbers would have been or probably would have been before the Industrial Revolution and afterwards. So this is all applied here and this is all part of the system. Now I did this post on my on my blog where I explained all these numbers. Uh, it's uh, I don't know if I want to go through it again. The total amount of iron is divided first of all by the Hmm. How best to explain this? Here is the total amount of gold that exists in the world, and that gold is divided by the total amount, the, the total references. The, this ounce is divided by 229, gives us a number 1,360 ounces per reference. So the without changing this. The idea is that every reference is worth the same reference in gold as it is in gold. So these 517 references of iron are worth exactly the same amount per reference as these 229 references in gold. That means if we take 517 divided by 229, that tells you that all of this gold in the world, or all of this iron in the world, rather, is worth 517 over 229 times this amount of gold. So, if we just want to mess around with it, I don't even know if you guys can read this on Blogger. Let's hope that you can. Um, the moment I'm not even sure okay there we can enlarge it all right so if we're taking this amount of iron 517 divided by 229 we're just taking out the X over 229 and we're multiplying that against the total amount of gold per per reference 
the total iron over the total gold multiplied by the total amount of gold, the actual physical amount, 311,529 ounces, which means the total iron in the world is actually worth 703,320 ounces of gold, more, which is worth more than all the gold that's in the world. But of course, one ounce of iron isn't worth anything like one ounce of gold. Now, this leap, this, this decision, not to make all of the objects in the world equal to all of the amount of gold was a tremendously freeing thing. It meant that prior I was I was locked into this perception that the value of mithril in order to to work out the value of mithril as in terms of well compare mithril to gold, the logical thing to do would be to divide the amount of mithril into the amount of gold and to assume that all the mithril in the world is worth exactly as much as all the gold in the world. And there's really no reason to make that assumption. But I did for years and years and years, and it really, it really fucked up my trade tables. It wasn't until I realized that there was no reason why all the commodities should be worth as much as every other commodity that I began to realize that, that there were ways to calculate this out so that so that there was there was a greater value. Now of course somebody's going to jump in and I'll just say so. That all the coal in the world, eight hundred and seventy eight references here, is therefore worth more than all the iron in the world. And people could dispute that. But sixteen fifty coal there may be a lot of references to it, but that doesn't mean we're pulling a lot of coal out of the ground. Nothing like we would be 150 years later. So it's reasonable to assume that coal has a certain value. It's very convenient. But, of course, there's still 23 million, according to my references, there's still 23 million ounces of coal being produced in the world. So there may be a lot of references to it to add the price, but there's an awful lot of coal being dragged out. I might have said million, billion, at any rate, 23 billion ounces. So we divide everything, therefore, not by the total amount of gold, but by the amount of gold per reference. And that gives us our total value. That's our 703,000 that we worked out up there, uh, which is now deleted. So this means that uh, we have multiplied now the... Uh, the total amount of iron that is available in this particular place in southern Pakistan and the amount of, divided by the total amount of references everywhere in the world multiplied by the total value of iron and that gives us the total value of iron in just this part of the world uh, not everywhere else. We can then compare that by multiplying it against the amount of copper which is uh, 16 silver pieces per gold piece and 12 silver or 12 copper pieces per silver pieces 192 copper pieces per gold piece and we can work this out at 8.715 gold pieces per ounce of gold which means that most of the gold piece isn't gold but uh, we can mm, guesstimate and the average weight of a gold piece at around 7 to 9 grams and that most of that is either silver or copper or some other fill, but we can we can we can make an estimate, and it's this is based off a of favorite coin that I have, a uh, stator from the uh, from the early Greek period that I just I needed a number, so the amount of gold that's here or the amount of gold coins per ounce is 8.715, so this gives us a number a base number of 0 0.06 copper pieces per ounce of iron. And an ounce of iron isn't worth very much money. Now, we have here the uh, the division where we've simply divided this by this to give us a percentage and we find that the amount of iron that's available in this part of Pakistan is 1% of the amount of iron everywhere in the world. And since we use 5% as the basis for whether or not something is is, is valuable. That means that the the core base price, the 0 .6, 0 0.06 copper per ton is multiplied by 5 because it works out to 1, but of course not exactly 1, but close enough. And we see a total of 0 0.29 copper pieces per ounce of gold in Pakistan. 
And then this is done for every raw material, gems here, and foodstuffs. Uh, not very many foodstuffs. You'll notice that I only do peppermint and edible bird's nest because these are things that, well, they don't they don't really have a manufacturing. Whale oil comes, I mean, it is obviously manufactured, but there's no pre commodity number that I have for whale oil, so therefore whale oil becomes the base commodity for that particular thing. Uh, here's for uh, for pelts. We have it for various textiles here. Uh, these actually don't need to be here. They're just they're just garbage. And there's tons of this and so on, but I don't worry about that so much. Anyway, here are various textiles, and then we have wooden products. All of these things are are listed in the industrial um, statistics yearbook. So we have wooden products. Uh, we don't have any of these for things that are made of wood. Uh, but we have the numbers here and we have the references for those things and you'll notice they don't have a reference for bobbins because I haven't updated it. Uh, now all the things that are made of wood um, from the encyclopedia I don't get conveniently always reference to woodcraft I get a reference to buckets or a reference to spinning wheels or a reference to uh, olive presses or something like that so I add all of those things together to give me one number for woodcrafting which I can then work with so these are the number of references for woodcrafting and I have these on all these uh, pages so that I can mess them together from the input data which doesn't organize them. I can take all the various woodcrafting things and put them together. I can take all the medicinal agent references. I can take the various earthenware references and I can group them together so that they can be all controlled and and so that I can I can apply them later on. Here's a list of all the different cereals that come together to make that 34 cereals number that we referenced before. So all of these numbers uh, and and uh, four cereals, you'll notice that I only have the one reference and the one price because basically if you're buying cereals, you don't really care um, if you're in that particular area and that is what that particular area eats, you're not looking at a supermarket mentality here. You're going to buy whatever you can eat for your family down at the market and if all they have is oats, then you're going to buy oats. And if all they have is barley, then you're going to buy barley and you're going to know what to make with the barley. So there isn't going to be all that much of a difference that makes makes it worthwhile working it out in the trade system. The difference in price of wheat versus barley. People are going to pay the same amount for both because they more or less, from a medieval renaissance perspective, provide the same basic thing. So they're going to be Certain products are going to be interchangeable. You're going to buy what's available at a particular moment, and you're not going to say, well, I don't want to buy oats because I don't like oats. I prefer wheat. That's a 20th century mentality, and it doesn't exist in a medieval world. And so you shouldn't be developing a system, a trade system, for D&D &D that respects something which doesn't exist. So um, there is a difference, of course, in spices. Spices taste very different. They come from very different areas. They have very different elements. So I have a different price for all the spices. They are not all grouped together. And note the tremendous price for saffron, which is always very expensive. That's 7,434 copper pieces per ounce. That's quite a lot of gold. Anyway, so we have uh, these various items. Uh, all the vegetables are grouped together, um, all the nuts are grouped together, all the tubers are grouped together, basically for the reasons that I described about before. Um, walnuts and almonds and cashews and so on and so forth are more or less interchangeable as far as cooking goes. Um, you can cook chicken with walnuts, you can cook chicken with, with cashews, you can cook chicken with pistachios. It may taste different, but fundamentally, if your process is, is feeding your family and feeding yourself, then you're going to you're going to make what's ever at the table. And if you want to be specific, and I am specific, I do give a, a specific price. But if we're, we're talking about just a base price, uh, then more or less these things are all in the same ballpark. Uh, there, there. I have another system on another table that I'm, we'll be coming to that determines um, the difference between an artichoke and an asparagus. So anyway, here are farm animals, and these are all based on this, the number of head and so on, and then finally fish, and that's the total number. 
I'm probably not going to get to the end of this. Uh, there's quite a long way to go. I am I'm, I'm gonna skip this spell thing. Um, this is a a method that I was trying to work on to determine the number of clerics that were in the world, and therefore the availability of spells, and therefore how much would you pay or how long, say, would you have to wait in order to get a spell. And it's not bad. It kind of works, but there are issues with it. And at some point, when I care, because again, this isn't a priority, I'm going to sit down and try to figure out a better way to do this. But for the moment, it does give me numbers, and it does make it does make low-level spells pretty cheap, and it makes high-level spells uh, not necessarily expensive, but almost impossible to find, because there are so few people in the world who would actually be capable of producing a spell, uh, a seventh-level spell. So, that brings us to this table. Now, this is the raw material cost table, and for various reasons, these are grouped together so that I know the total references for all the ores, all the building stone, all the chemical materials, and so on. Um, for the moment, we don't really have to worry about that. I, I prefer uh, each of these. Each of these calculations are moderately different for uh, various reasons. They they. Uh, some of them have been very much tailored for the particular kind of product. The uh, the the one that I think I would like to show is the same is the same basic one that I did for my blog a long time ago, but now I'm showing it on on this, and it's how to determine the price of meat uh, from the from the basic fact of you have a cow. So if if we want to start with a cow, and here is an adult cow, and I'm not certain that this can be seen, so let me come in close. Uh, if we start with an adult cow, we're starting with 8,000 ounces of meat on that cow. Now, this is a great deal less meat that would be on a cow in the modern age. Cows have been developed, they've been expanded, they've been blown up like balloons, they're given a lot of steroids and other things that give them a lot more meat. So if you go looking for how much meat will you get off a cow, you're going to probably find a lot more references to the 20th century when cows weighed up to 1,500 pounds as opposed to the 17th century when cows, by and large, tended to weigh about 500. So, uh, working off numbers that I found, uh, an average cow produces 8,000 ounces of meat. Uh, this is cost per ounce. Now, it, you'll notice it's saying it take H. 925 and divided by the number of ounces. Well, H925, if we come down through all of this pile here, we find it here, 925, there's cattle. Now, the price of a cow starts with our base cost of a price per head. That's from our reference table back here, which gives us 6 million, pardon me, this is cows, gives us 12, 0.588 million head in the world and calculated by our same method gives us a total of 423 copper per head. So this is our base price for a cow. Uh, this is our base price for an adult cow. The uh, uh, the weight here is in reference to the amount of food that the cow eats per day. The uh, uh, maturation period is two years, so you're more or less feeding your cow for two years. Of course, a lot of this food is also being taken straight off the pasture, so the 56 ounces per day, this is in reference to additional food that you're adding so that your cow stays healthy and strong. A cow that eats just off the pasture will produce even less meat. So this is a way of determining the price of the cow depending on how old the cow is. So that a calf is paid is eaten eats over more or less the same amount, but because you're going to start slaughtering the cow or the calf in three months, the actual cost for the calf is only 881 copper pieces per head, while the cost for the cow is four is 4,139. 
Now, if you buy the cow as a baby, the moment that it is born, you buy it as the calf as it comes out of the cow, then your price is 423.1, but you can't slaughter it for at least three months when the calf grows large enough and heavy enough to make it worthwhile. So here's your cost. Your H925 gives you your cost at 4,139 copper pieces per head per cow. Uh, mind you, this is in Pakistan. You would get from, because we would be putting in different data in here with different references, which would divide the numbers differently. If we were doing this in Germany, or we were doing this in Russia, or ultimately we were doing this in China. If I, I haven't added China yet, but if we were doing this in China, so the cost per cow is going to be different in different parts of the world. Now, I could muck around with it and say that the weight per cow would be different in different parts of the world, but we don't have to get completely crazy. We can assume that the weight is always 8,000. So going back up to cow, therefore, to where we were previously, the Therefore, the cost per ounce divided this 4,000 divided by the 8,000, the cost per ounce of the, the meat from this cow as it is on the hoof. This means the cow is still out in the field where it hasn't been brought in. It hasn't, the farmer still has it. He hasn't taken it to town. So you're buying it in the field. It's, 50, it's 0.52 ounces. So this is what you would get if you walked up to the farmer and you said, all right, I want this cow. Can you slaughter it now? And I'll take away the meat. That this is what the farmer would charge you for it. This isn't what you would get. This isn't the cost in town. Now, the farmer has brought it into town, and it has been placed into a stockyard. Now, here, this number here is reference B1006. So we'll come back to the reference table. And that would be this general livestock reference. Now, from the encyclopedia, I didn't always get a number or a, a name for what kind of livestock a particular area found. A lot of times it would just be, you know, livestock. So I took that and I used that particular reference number and applied it to where to to the cost for actually maintain or holding the livestock in a pen this is this is the cost that the 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 city has paid so the difference between buying it in the farm and buying it in the stockyard is is that it increases the price and the way that it increases the price is it takes this number and it divides it by that number and then it adds it again to this number so the higher this number is, this reference number, the less the change is going to be. So if there are a lot of stockyards in the region, then there's not going to be very much difference in the cost. And if there's very, very, very few stockyards, then there's going to be quite a lot of difference. So in this case, the uh, 0.61 is uh, 0.52 divided by 5.832 plus 0.52, which means that if you're buying this in town, but nothing's been done with it. It's simply being, it's simply standing inside a pen in town and you want to slaughter it, but you don't want to pay anybody else to slaughter it. The, the stockyard will, will sell you the cow or potentially somebody will slaughter the cow for you. But somebody will slaughter the cow for you in the stockyard or sell you the cow in the stockyard at 0.61 ounce or uh, 0.61 copper pieces Per ounce. Now, if you want to argue as a DM that this particular cow is 434 pounds or this particular cow is 513 pounds, then you can multiply this number for the stockyard by the number of pounds the cow is, or rather the amount of meat the cow provides, because obviously a cow weighs more than 8,000 ounces. But that's the amount of meat on the cow. So if you want to say that this these cows are all bigger cows, then this number gives you the the um, ability to say, well, these cows are more expensive than those cows because these cows are fatter. So these are cows that you're buying per per the value of the meat that is on the cow. The abattoir then is the cost of slaughtering the cow, and we can go back to references B180 here, okay? And that would be way, way, way up here. And here's B180, and here's a general food stuff reference. Now, we, we hit the wrong button. And we temporarily goofed the. All right. So, anyway, let me fix that.
So in this particular case, like the livestock reference, we have a foodstuff reference. Where, again, in the encyclopedia, I had no references except foodstuffs. Uh, they didn't tell me what kind of foodstuffs that they were producing and so on. And so I use that as a general processing value that the uh, almost everything has a general processing. Um, cereals, the groats and the meal is removed from cereals to clean it up. That's a processing. Uh, the whale oil is distilled and so on so that it's cleaner. That's processing. Uh, olive oil, same thing. Uh, if you wanted extra virgin, that virgin, that's a processing fee. So for all of those things, I applied general the, the general foodstuffs number. So in this case, the general foodstuffs number is applied specifically to the abattoir. So again, the number is the same. We divide this number by 2.012, and we add it back to that number, and that gives us a price for how much it costs if you want to buy the meat after it has been cut off the cow. Now the cow is dead, the meat is sitting on the butcher's table at the abattoir, but it's not on the butcher's table out in his store. So given a D&D &D reference, uh, a medieval reference where the abattoir doesn't exist yet, or at least it only exists in very specific places, the difference between the price of the abattoir and the price that the butcher charges for his customers is the difference between the back door of the butchers and the front door of the butchers. So the butcher might be willing to give you the price of the beef on wholesale, so this is the wholesale price for that beef at 0.91 copper pieces per ounce, but if you're buying it from the front of his store, then you're buying it from the, 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 the cost for the butcher. You're buying it from, from the butcher himself. So he's going to charge a great deal more because there are fewer references specifically to beef and meat than there are to to uh, to abattoir or, or to, to just foodstuffs in the encyclopedia that I that I got all my references from. So the cost here this cost here, this 2.92, is based on coming back to the references. So this is reference D252. We come back to this reference here, and you can see here's beef. Here's beef. Here are my references to beef. And there aren't a lot of references in southern Pakistan to beef or to slaughtered beef. So there's some only there's less than there's there's only 0.13, so there's less than one reference altogether. But there's only 13 in the world because you know there isn't that much there isn't that much money in butchering. There's a lot of money in the meat itself, but there's not that much money in butchery. But that's okay; they get around it by seriously king up, kicking up the overhead. So he's going to kick it up to where uh, again this number or rather this number is divided by that number and added to that number so that we get the price he's going to charge you is now at 2.92 copper pieces per per ounce. So you see, if, you're, if you get into the beef business and you get into the butchery business, I've got the numbers here to tell you whether or not how much profit you're going to make from that. Not only that, if you get into the into the in fair business, yeah, look at this number here. This is for innkeeper. Now this is from the table itself. It says raw material cost C one seventeen. So let's go up and look at what C one seventeen is, or what C seventeen is rather. And here, here's the foodstuffs. Here's our market share for the total number of foodstuffs. It's two point eight four divided. Uh, it's a, a of of all the 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 foodstuff references that exist. Our market share, which is divided by the uh, the total market in Gwadar, by the total market, uh, by the total trade everywhere in Gwadar, which means the overhead, how much, how much of a percentage of the economy are the people who are in charge of moving the money around as opposed to the people who are actually doing things. Well, in this case, the market share is used as a reference so that we can figure out how much the innkeeper is adding. And the innkeeper in different towns and in different cities and in different parts of the world is going to add a different amount. The innkeeper in Italy is going to add a higher stipend above the price from the butcher than somebody in a backward sort of country that doesn't have a lot of doesn't have a lot of market reference. So here's our price at the inn. Um, yes, granted, it's more expensive. You 
can walk up the street and buy it at the butcher. But if you're going to buy it while you're at the inn and you're comfortable and you're a stranger, then you're going to pay that. Now, here's the price for sausage. And this is simply references to, and this doesn't come from the inn, obviously. This comes back from the butcher. The, the, sauce, the guy making the sausage buys his reference or buys his his meat from the butcher. So he makes sausages from that. Obviously, a sausage maker could buy his meat from somewhere else, but he's going to sell it at the same price as other sausage makers, and he's going to pocket the difference. So if people are prepared to pay this amount of money for a sausage, then he's going to pay that. You can see that sausage is a different price for goat or for reindeer or for veal, depending on what the base animal is. Um, You'll, you'll notice that the, that the price for veal is higher than the price for beef, even though the price for a calf was lower. Well, you know, that's because the calf is divided by, is weighs less. So the base, the base weight per cost is still higher, even though the overall calf costs less. So these are little details that kind of nicely mess around with the system. And then here's pate, because I found references to pate, and I even found a reference to pate de foie gras. So here's the difference, or here's the distance between Pakistan and the rest of the world, because here's your pate de foie gras, and the total references to pate de foie gras in southern Pakistan is 0.02 references. So this really kicks the price up quite a lot. But the chances are, and this is, this is incorporated elsewhere in the system, the chances are that this cost is, or this this reference, pardon me, that these references mean that you won't find it. It's a, if you did find it, it would be this much, but the chances of finding it are almost negligible. So that's why so much of my equipment tables, when I display my equipment tables, show blanks. The simply thing simply isn't available. That the the object itself, it, it might be nice, but if we go to the butcher and we look up pate de foie gras, you'll see there is no price. And I'll enlarge this. You'll see there is no price for pate de foie gras <coughs> because the likelihood of finding it just doesn't exist. So all of these things come together in one one large um, envisioned ideal so that you have a different price for everywhere on earth and that price isn't randomly generated it isn't just a, a it isn't just dice thrown it is a very logical very detailed very systematic system of determining the distance between two places right down to which hex does the road go through determining how far those places are from other places, how that affects the number of references for that specific place, and then ultimately comparing it system by system, item by item. Uh, the, the, the cost on the hoof, the cost at the, the abattoir, the cost for the butcher, the cost for how much it costs to make, make sausage out of it, and so on and so forth. For every single object that that parties could conceivably ever want to buy, from from chairs to furs to to glass to to, to to goldsmithing to the cost of jewelry to the cost of the innkeeper to how much the leather worker charges you for armor to how much your 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 your, your loot costs you. Everything is ultimately based on this same complex distilled system where the amount of wood and where you are in the world from that wood determines the cost of each individual object, not just in terms of the object or the wood itself, but in terms of who's cutting the wood and who's making the wood and who are the luthiers and how far are you from luthiers and is it even likely that there would be a loot anywhere in this part of the world. So this is this is all based on one single construction. Now I will get back to this and I will make another video that discusses this um, because I do want to come to the price tables and how that works. But for the time being, I'm going to call this and thank you and I hope that uh, somebody out there got some value out of what I've been doing here. Thank you.